Fallschirm erkannt. Okay, so what is it about? That's me. Yeah. Hey, Luz. Don. So, you all know about OWASP, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Who is using OWASP tools? What's this? It's kind of bit. It's a bit starting. Yeah. <laughs> what I hear mostly is that OWASP, uh, the problem is our website. The wiki, everything is on the wiki, but it's hard to find when you don't know what to look for. The same problem is when someone comes new, they, he must hear about a tool to use the tool. So they don't know by default, hey, I go to the website, I see this great tool or this my particular problem, I can find it. That's why I do these talks to show there's more about OWASP than the OWASP tab. But we will hopefully work on that soon. First, as a recap, OWASP was the, uh, set up 2001 from the developers for developers. Because in 2001, what was new? The web. The web was there already, but it became big. So they said the original, the initial mission statement, the finding, fighting, defending, of course, on secure software. Who is the developer here? That's back and wide, isn't it? Everything has to be secure. Is it possible? Yeah, we got smarter too. We thought, okay, this is not working. After six, seven years, we found out this will not work. Why didn't that work? Because when you go to your CEO, say, cool, uh, my command line, I pwn your uh, mail server. What will they say? Okay, thanks. We don't understand what you're talking about. So we had to address those who go about the money and the development with the business. So we changed the mission statement to from uh, the finding, 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 of course, unsecured software into making the risk visible so the business can take the right decisions. That's what we do. Business has the money, the business pays you for your software, for your security activities, for everything. We have to tell them why it's needed. What is the business risk? Who is using the OSTO 10? What are you using it for? Yeah. I try not to ask rhetorical questions. But what is in the OSTO 10? The 10 most found issues. Nope. They don't make mistakes? Nope. That's what it was in the past. So it was set 3, 4, and 7. It was the highest risk of vulnerability, or the most severe, or the most common vulnerabilities. But as we changed the mission statement to make the risk uh, more, uh, uh, the business with the risk more visible for the business, we change it into um, what is the business risk. But it's not the most relevant ones. It's an awareness document. Like, hey, look at this. We changed our three years. Like, after three years, now you should change your scope to those risks. So it's feed by data these days, but it's an awareness document. It's not a checklist. Still, I come to customers and say, oh yeah, we use the OWASP. Where are OWASP compliant? I have. <laughs> <laughs> Who of you is always compliant? <laughs> compliant. Yeah. You should be physically punished for that. It, there is no always compliancy. There is no always certificate. People are, yeah, we are always certified. You can't. I had an RFP and they asked companies to be always certified. Like, what? We don't have that. So the always that is an awareness document. That's the only, solely reason it is there. Only to raise awareness and tell when you have a vulnerability, they're very global, you can use it to tell the business why you should do it. And I don't get it that people don't, still don't understand that OWASP 10 is a risk, uh, a risk document because the all, new OWASP 10, the A10 that is? Logging and monitoring. Yeah, insufficient logging and monitoring. Where is the vulnerability? No, it's about detecting vulnerability. Okay. So the OWASP 10 it should have been released uh, Earlier, there was some commodity, and I want to address that. I put my hand in fire for the integrity of Dave Richards. I don't know if, if you heard about the commodity. He had, in the previous version of the 10, he came up with a top 10 item, but it's very specific to his business. We were like, ah, oh, he is pushing this because of his company. No, this is his area of work, so this becomes very visible to him. That's why he put it in there. So, go in there. Let's go back. Home of you is supporting developers. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing that? By showing them, hey, I hacked your code, it was as I said earlier, when your baby's <laughs> ugly. No. That will not work. I always are surprised that when they come to developers, as the security guy, they're like this. They ask me, oh yeah, you are uh, looking at the security of my application. Very surprised because what do you think was my answer? 
I said, no. No? But you're the security guy. I said, yes. And together, we look in the application, we'll see where it can be improved. It's a different way of content. It's an open question, you put it together, you talk to them, you do it next to them so they can learn. I still see security professionals, they do the security magic, if possible remote, from home in the night. And then what comes out from your own security magic? A PDF report. <laughs> <laughs> that will not work. And in reverse, the PDF report will not work in the Agile, DevOps, CDI, CD pipeline. Because they do a spend for two weeks. Then you do your one or two week security magic, they always move towards sprint. Then you go, hey, the last sprint, this is for your errors. They're like, ah, time complexity problem, <laughs> because I'm not here, that I was there. And what did I do? Do you know what you did two weeks ago? If I ask you, what did you do on uh, Thursday over there? I don't know what you uh, if pre <laughs> Thursday in the afternoon, last uh, two weeks ago, what did you do? Yes, it's a problem. You don't know anymore because you're busy and you're in the now and not in two weeks ago or even longer ago. So we have to continuous delivery train. Yeah? The developer building software, and that's what you need. They may be proud of the software. When I ask them, are you a developer? They're like, you must be proud of it. You have to appreciate it for the work because if you get appreciation, you have satisfaction and you make better job. It's very clear. It's that easy. It's for you too. Whatever is your job, when you appreciate it, you will do a better job because you're proud of your result. Craftsmanship is the key. So we have to continue to do with pain, and there comes the security token. <laughs> Fail. And then even worse, they say, ha ha, that's all the issue one. Because you're a security expert, and you need many vulnerabilities, isn't it? The report must be heavy. <laughs> it must be heavy PDF. <laughs> that's so that's why you put it in the almost top 10. <laughs> in every security report, I don't know why. <laughs> and then they say, oh, that's all wrong. And the developers, what do you think was their response? It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. What? They're looking for critical. No, they, I just see it as an error in my life. They, they do like, what? They, hey, you have a cross like this forgery. Over here, see, sir. They're like, what, sir? <laughs> Nobody told them. Because it's not the functionality, there's never talked about security, it's about functionality, intuitivity, has to be faster, has to be beautiful, shiny, new, flashy. Security? Yeah, they hear about the security report. First time they heard about it. If you don't know in the beginning what you look for, you will fail in the end. It's very you don't have the requirements in there, they will fail. It's very logically. But even worse, you have to always the ten. And unfortunately, a lot of tool vendors or whatever, Based their reporting on OS 10 because back then there was nothing else. I always say OS 10 is our blessing and our curse. Blessing for the OS name exposure and the curse because it's the most useful we have. So with there was nothing else except the common vulnerability enumeration, but it had a thousand entries. I cannot go in the contract. There must be none of the CVEs in this. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. But then there was OS 10 say, hey, I can manage 10 items. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> I still have vulnerability uh, scanners. They say, will you test for the OSO 10? That newest one, yes. I say, how do you test this vulnerability scanner for <laughs> insufficient locking and monitoring? <laughs> or no un, uh, on, no unsecure dependencies? You can't. You cannot do it from the outside. So that was OSO 10. And then we got something new. The OSO testing guide. And we have a new version recently, I think one, one year ago. But there comes something new out. They're like, oh, we have a testing guide. All these vulnerabilities describe how to discover them because it's a testing guide. It's about where to test, how to test, and then describe what bad vulnerability. What is it? How to test for it? Was your, uh, uh, what you want to find? And how you can discover it. So what do you get then? You say, oh, there's a new standard. And it's the NCC. You know them? Who's the NCC? National Cyber Security Yeah, and they thought, oh, we need Web, uh, line. Line. And what do you use? The OWASP testing guide. <laughs> that's how you find vulnerabilities, <laughs> and they say that's how you write secure software. That is not really compatible. But there's something better, and we'll talk about it later. But the first thing is, when you help developers writing code, where's the first thing to start with? Hint. Who gets the hint? 
Als ze first thing stoppen. Clean code. Clean code, this is it. I can make uh, very good food in a dirty kitchen, but it's really hard. If you have a clean kitchen, it's very easy to make clean code. When your software kitchen is clean, you deliver a clean code, it's by default better uh, maintainable, it's better readable, it's more secure. It's like when you're using test driven development, you write less code, less code is less bugs. It's that easy. It's the first thing you start, clean up the mess, make it a very clean and lean coding kit. Every tool in place, all the knives sharp, surface clean. And then you start to load. The first tool, uh, project I want to say, is the proactive controls. Actually, there's a new version released just before I finish this presentation. The first time I've got to update it. That's really good. Because when you are starting, when you're trying to, to high jumping, everybody does that? I'm slightly high jumping. How about in English? Hoch jumping. Uh, yeah, high jumping. I, I have a weight disadvantage. <laughs> ben is, less weight is better. But when you want to go for high jumping, you don't put a bar on the world record. Because you have no chance to get there. And that's kind of what security people want to do. Like, this is the bar. That's, everything must be secure. It's not reachable. You put it low there, and you slowly raise the bar. You can prove them and take them with you. Not like, ha fail again. Oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> Will not work. And the first thing you can do then is starting with the proactive control. The thing everybody can do easily. What you see in there is like, Fairfax security early and often. What for security? Look what is your context. We have to start with the code quality tooling. It's not security yet. Yes, I know Zonotype has some security measures. You will not be satisfied for security, but it helps them to understand what it's about. Parameterized queries. There is a way how we write software. I hear people, yes, yeah, but it's a small application. I just don't really know. We are professionals. Craftsmanship. Help them to learn, understand craftsmanship. The severity of the application makes some difference in how you code. It makes difference in the verification or in the design. It's not the developer who decides a two-fact authentication. It's the designer. The developer has to write craft code, quality code. So that's what things we should do. Encode data, validate all inputs. Like how easy can it be? Make it simple, clear, understandable. As I said, new proactive controls are very simple and understandable for them. Threat modeling, clean code, input validation, output handling, parameterized queries. Very simple, the basics. And most likely, 80% of your problems are gone, all the low hanging fruit. Even better, you can automate tests for that. And what you can automate, you can repeat, it makes it cheaper, it might early feedback, the right code, and in half an hour they got feedback. Instant feedback, like little children. If I have a four-year-old, if I tell him that, like a week later what he done wrong last week, we don't help. Developers, security people, exactly the same. Instant feedback is what you need. <coughs> and then, who knows about OWASP? Some. You heard about it? Some is sort of assured maturity model. We always hear the business, they go going strive for functionality. And they describe functionality in their happy flow, of course, because they have a business requirement. That must be the flow, so that's the sort of thing it should do. And that's all the implicit security expectations. And then they say the developers, oh, they do all wrong, and it's a stupid developers, and the developers don't appreciate it anyway because they are too slow, and the process takes too long, they are too expensive, so we will outsource them anyway. That really makes them appreciate it. This shares the responsibility in your uh, so, uh, company. Everybody has favorites, everybody has rights for. Your favorites, you are always cutting edge. So the improvement on your favorites takes much more time, much more energy for very small improvement. But the blind spot, it's very big gains with very little impact, uh, effort. And then look for governance, constructive verification, and it's the whole slide, sorry, operation. What should be in place to be able to write a mature software development? Software mature, mature model tells you like, in the governance, do I have my strategy matrix? Do I know compliance? Does my stakeholder understand what kind of compliance we have as a company? I was in a company once when I was a software architect, and I said, do you have an abuse case, a use case? Do you know how the application should be used? I know. Oh yeah, by the way, it must be compliant to all, uh, 
uh, policies that are relevant for us. Oh, no, no, only those that are relevant for us. And I said, I'm the security guy. I, I developed the background software architect. I don't know. I don't know what the compliance requirements for your company. Yeah, but uh, we don't know them either. <laughs> <laughs> we have many times when I do some assessment, I see that security architects, officers, by authority, have all the documents very well described. They make no sense in development because they're sitting on the tower and they found somewhere in the basement. There's no communication. And this one we feel it because you put every department, from your business owner, from your stakeholder, from your tester, from your developers, I take. You take them and ask them the questionnaire, there's a self assessment. You will see most of them, there's not everything is well. They do something, just it's not known on the other department. They never talk to each other. This helps you to define these gaps. And the weather is not, again, this is the target. Let's run there. No, you have a condition. Uh, uh, you can fill out a roadmap. You have to find a roadmap. How to get there? So you're not going to the business and say, hey, I need 30,000 euros to improve security. No. We stand together. We define what is our goal. How far we want to be the next year. And you define a roadmap. How to get there? It makes it much more visible and measurable. That's a problem. A friend of mine, uh, but I can't uh, got the name, Dick Martin, Marco, hmm, some Italian guy lives in the US. <laughs> <laughs> if he wants to move in, show it here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they shouldn't say that. Before. <laughs> That's been recorded, yeah. Most people know that I'm not that well in known names and faces. <laughs> My wife once said, just fake it. Look at the other guys, it's just talk along. Marco Morano? Yes. So uh, Matteo came over and came in. So I thought, oh, let's try it. Let's do it. So somebody comes in and says, hey, Matt, how are you doing? Say, great, how are you doing? He says, who am I? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was Marco. Marco Morano. Morano. So he understood the difference between the security architects and the chief security officer of Blah and the developers. He said, what have we as always for them to help them to understand software development and understand what they need to do? And they are working now on a, a New York version. So we have to also test a awareness document. We have the testing guide it tells you how to test. What do we miss? What do we miss? We miss something that tells you what to do. And that actually is in the ASVS, the Application Security Verification Tender. It tells you what to do, not how to do it. That helps you on three levels. Not everything has to be secure. But what should you do on a different level of maturity? It's better. But one thing you should not forget, and it's something in the testing guide. Oh, no, sorry. You could use the conference all day. But it helps you on a lot of different items to say what you should do. For uh, in architecture design, do we have defined and described all components and versions that you need for your application? If I thought they said, oh, we don't know that, it's like, oh, we use Maven and all the dependencies, then you have a problem. If you don't know what is in your application, you have no control what is will actually will be deployed. Perhaps for that, yeah? This, 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 uh, a bit louder, this, I'm above 40. This, this is, um, I think, uh, 180 points. Yes. I was busy two weeks just testing for this I the requirement. I help you. Give me a second. I help you about it. Way too long. Yeah, I had one. Is it too long? Is it a bit? Um, so the, what I'm missing in this project is the why for question. What? Why do you do it? Yes, I, I will speak to them next week. We have an object conference. Okay. That's something we will put in there. But for your question, I will help you. One sec. What else do you see in this? What do you see? What do you realize when you read this? Quickly. What's wrong? They are missing a few. Why are they missing a few? Uh, like uh, uh, mixed. Yes, what they did, they did a new version, but they didn't want to change all the numbering. So, like for example, six partly stuff have gone, and something has been merged to other stuff. So it's not half the truth. It's just the update, and they kept the versioning. Yeah. And one thing to work with that is not going through the checklist with the developers. 
because it's not a development, it's an item thing. But what you can use the HVS is, for example, gamification and security. Call a copy of the project. Who knows about that? Who knows the Microsoft uh, uh, privilege escalation uh, game? It's really, really good because now you go with your team and you need very good understanding of the project you are talking, this game thing about. And for me, I need the incentive to win because I want to win and I need other people to win. That's me. And, sorry. Uh, and here you play card game. For example, you play the escalation ejection card and you have to explain why escalation ejection is possible. And the others don't want you to make this card. They have to find reasons why it's not possible. I played it with one uh, uh, customer for a training. We only played two rounds. We found five possible abilities. Because finally, over the departments now, they talk to each other. Like, hey, and they're not behind the keyboard. So they're playing and they're talking about it. Gamification is the key. And that's based on the RSVS. Because now there's some um, security verification standard that's meant to what you should do. There's something else, and that's your problem. 185 items. Are they all relevant? No. No, it's depending on the software. Right. So, what from Eins and Eins uh, names, Daniel Kefer and René Reuter, they had the same problem. They were the security the development teams, and you gave them a book, all about the thing. That's how you write secure software. They will never will read it. What they did is, Writing a system, writing the security requirement automation tool, then you define not the requirements, but you say, what kind of application is it? Is it mobile? Is it Android or iOS? Microsoft, what uh, Microsoft uh, phone? Just a silly system. Microsoft phone is Android. Yeah, that's what I was okay. <laughs> Just wonder, you didn't know for sure. Just make sure. Stay. Go. Is it the Java backend? Is it the .NET backend? Is it the cloud solution? You define it, and based on this, you get a subset that is relevant of the ACS. So not all ACS, all the, those who are relevant for that. And it's still not only the what to do, not how to do it. But still, you have only a subset that's relevant. And you can add it, extend it, uh, for your own requirements, for your own country. Okay? So this is what good. And then you have the items, it directly uploads them to Chaya or to uh, export as uh, common separate files because it's not a document static. It must be dynamic. It must live in development teams. The most development use Chaya, so you can export the items, the to do items, to your development team in their environment in an online Chaya form. Yeah, it's getting better. Yeah. It's good after following up. Good side here. Because then you only had this what to do, not how to do it. There are two brothers from the Netherlands, Ricardo and Lenden Kanga. They have the problem that they explained it over and over again. They said, this is not working. Everything I repeat, I should automate. So what they said is, that's a secure knowledge framework. What you do here, security knowledge framework, I always say it's wrong. What they do here is having the ASVS with almost the same checklist as the security work. You have the subject of things you should do. So your application, what kind of application is it, with environment, with what kind of data, and you get a subject, uh, a subset of the HVS. But not as a security get what you do, you have the developer how to do it. You have two things. No. They have the two things. One is the knowledge base. So they can search it from, hey, I'm writing a file upload thing. What does it mean for me? What's the impact? Explain to me what is the risk. And then have code examples in many languages in Java, .NET, C Sharp, PHP, Python, with examples from how to do it. Very well documented code. So there's two things. They're now working on a command line interface that you can ask the system like how to do uh cross <coughs> request when you talk. Stuff like that. So start my interaction. So knowledge base, how to do it, uh what is the risk, and the code examples how to do it. Based on the AFS. So if the AFS is new standard, security read what to do, and the security knowledge framework how to do it. Training. And because it's dynamic, it's not a book, it works in this area, in the uh, environment of the developer, being my IDE, my browser, maybe a command line interface. More a developer doesn't need, isn't it? But the first thing we should do is think about what could possibly go wrong. 
what if? The business should sort of think about it. The business can do it. People do it. But the developer needs to do it as well. What is the risk for doing something? We all know Microsoft has a very nice uh, threat modeling tool. We have now from uh, OWASP. It's a JavaScript application you can download. I mean, you're going at this normal threat modeling tool. It's Stripe based and it works very cheap. I, last week was also a guy who does uh, threat modeling from, from uh, SAP. He said, I don't want a tool. I really love that. And he says, I need flipovers. And I asked the team, the IT tech, the developer, and the unit developer, and they sit together. What he then says is, to the unit developer, show me the architecture. And to the IT tech, don't say a word. Don't even blink with your eyes. <laughs> because whatever you did, that is how you communicated how it's understood. That was thread modeling about. Yeah? Giving an insight what is possible, let's try it, hopefully, you know, let's try it. But proving temporary non recreation information disclosure, United States, and related privileges. What are the different areas in the different actors and processes? Yeah? So, also here we have. Then, still, we have in the past the developer guide. We have the testing guide. We now have also the mobile security testing guide. It's just for It's a really good book. But the book is a problem. The book has time to write. And you know, the moment you publish it, it's yeah. almost obsolete. Huh? It's okay. Yeah. Not all of them. I have the developer guy, like, oh, it's from 2007. Okay. What end is still relevant? Of course, not new technology, but it's still worth. That is how people think. The average developer is how old? <laughs> Maybe 30? Younger? Younger, no. Yeah. So what is their history? Four years? <laughs> like, oh, is it? I was in school when this book was written. <laughs> yeah. And we try to stop this. But <laughs> that can be good, because it's too old. That's yeah, but it's not how young people think. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I recall, when, when I was young, was like five years ago. Uh, so, Leo fits the paper. So, what we have is the cheat sheet, because you don't want to give them the fake books. I said, my own son is a developer, and I talked to him. I had, when he was studying a professional Java developer, I gave him my Java security books. And every time I left, they were on the top of the pile, and every time I came back, they were on the bottom of the pile. So what are you doing? Say, oh, other people do the security. It does not work because it's boring. But you need information at hand. I told you the browser is a part of the developer's environment and the cheat sheet are what is it? What is the impact? How to solve it? Very clear, very easy. So this security read what to do, security not trying how to do it, and here's more extra information what you think about it. For the developers, in knowledge, more pieces to understand. But then I told you about the almost, uh, I think it was A9, I don't know if it's still A9. He built applications and only 20% of the code you write yourself. The rest is frameworks, libraries, dependencies. And most of the time they don't even know how many dependencies we can. We use Gradle uh, and Maven. It's all done for us. Everything shall be secure. So you use, we use the old Maven file, maybe with words in it. And then you get dependencies, there are no vulnerabilities. Known to whom? To the security guys, not the developers. Always dependency track helps you understand what are the unknown vulnerabilities in the uh, dependencies you import. And of course, you need an interface with dependency track as well. Because they help you about what vulnerabilities, what dependency you have, and what's known about it. You can trace it about more visual than dependency check. It helps you understand not the only source code, but everything else that makes your software. Then, I hope everybody knows what this means. What is this? Yeah, seven. Oh, seven, yeah. What? Like your hand yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it is slowing down. <laughs> They're not that smart. Oh. So, oh, seven. Simon wrote this tool because he had, uh, for software development, he's still a software developer. He's not, he says himself, he's not a security guru or a knowledge worker. He had a software application and it comes as a, a security test. He gets coffee, comes back, and the other guy is in, is up in on his system. It's like, what happened? Then they talk about security. He says, I'm a developer. I need a tool that helps me to understand and test my security. So Yannis tells him everything about security tool, like verb and this scanner and whatever. He's like, they don't fit with me as a developer. Is there no tool that helps me as a developer to write secure code? And Yannis was like, nope. 
to seven, took action and did it himself. He fought the Paris proxy with Philip this. Why is this so revolutionary new? Because, not because it's Java based, because it has a full API. So when you have test automation, what you should have, it's only about the clean kitchen, you have the validation of functionality, you have set proxy listens that you want, you browse automation, you get set proxy, uh, the scope, and you don't want to test the application every time, because more release, I don't want to test the whole monolith. I want to test this part I changed, I want to test. So I want my new test, I want my functional testing, for the part I changed, and we set, for this scope, I do my security test. And because you have it, it works, and you do it, run it every time, you can improve it, extend the script interface, even REST API is getting better. <coughs> this project is so cool that many years ago, Mozilla said, you know what? You will work for us now. This became his job. Because he does a really good talk. It's a very nice example one. If you think that you are uh, uh, irritated with something, you can complain about it, or you can do something about it. That's what Simon did. And I say this project is good success because he's not a security guy, because he's a developer. Security guys have new tools, like, it's a cool tool, but it's mine. This is a good tool, but maybe you can share it with security. And he was frightened to do that. He told me, he's like, he released it, he was like, oh my god, they will... Yeah. Sorry? They will burn it down. Yeah, they will burn it down, they will smash me, throw me. <laughs> and everyone was like, this is cool. We all are all uh, afraid about this, but this is what happened. So what you do, you have your, hopefully, your test automation, your browser automation, your web in the middle, and you get the web server and you can listen to it. Because it has API extension, you can fully automate it. You get in the scope, the testing, the active scanning, the scripting. You can integrate it with Jenkins or Bamboo, whatever you want. And of course, we have this very... I, I come from the development in the 90s, uh, it was a very long time ago. And we had extreme programming. <laughs> that was really great, because they are very simple, still well, uh, valid items, like build for today, keep it simple. These days, there's nothing simple anymore. It's, um, you have this 25 year old full stack, senior full stack developer. That helps you. <laughs> so you have to make it simple again. <laughs> Is there anybody in the room? <laughs> so what you need, you have to develop a pipeline. You have a development pipeline. What you need is an upstream pipeline. You don't want to hinder or slow down development. You want to enable it. Security is not a ministerial no. Security is listen to them and help them to make it possible in a responsible way. This is how the AppSec pipeline helps you. This is the same problem. To the start, for an intake tool, our application, we rarely, barely write new applications. So do the intake first. What is the application about to make a baseline? As I said, it's not boiling the sea, everything has to be perfect next week. The first goal is not to make it work. If it's a live application, it's a fact already that one is out there. It's a second goal, first goal, not to make it worse. The second goal is to make it more secure. We have to understand that. The internet tool is here to take it in, then you look what is in there, and then you increase the test tooling, and then you go to the delivery tools, because everything we can automate, we automate, because humans make errors, they are good at it, so we don't want to skip the errors. <coughs> so what is the problem? If I add more than one tool, or if I use a tool on my AppSec pipeline, I get a report. The reports are static. If it's a PDF on the HTML, ooh, we have an HTML report or a JSON report, it's still static. Because every time I get a report, it goes through the report again. So you need something where you collect the vulnerability findings, you can uh, validate them, and you give the developer only those who are relevant. We look for security issues. So a true positive is some tool, report, everything detected in the vulnerability. What is the false positive? What is the false positive? Oh, I'm thinking it's a false vulnerability, but it isn't. What is the false negative? Thinking it's okay, but it is. What is more dangerous? Who thinks the false positive is more dangerous than the false negative? Uh, it depends what? on the yeah. <laughs> Who thinks the false negative is more dangerous than the false positive? That's a security view. Mm -hmm. Because I, there is something wrong and I never, <coughs> can, I cannot detect it. It's scary. For us. Not for the developer. Because he, when it gets the false positives, if 
7 or 5 out of 10 are false positives, what he will really say? This tool does not work. For every tool you put in the pipeline, you need tool acceptance. Now, when you do that in the build pipeline, every time you have to do it. If you do an abstract pipeline with an interface, a dashboard towards the developer, you don't have to convince them every time. You slowly raise the bar by adding tools and scans and tests and give them only the true positives. The, false, uh, the, the less certain true positives, you have to validate first to eliminate the false negatives. And you release them slowly and prove and validate it to the developers. How do you do that? There is TV Dojo. TV Dojo is a tool, it's a vulnerability manager. This one is quite heavily set on, normally on assignments. You have security assignments into the teams. But what it does is all the reports, and there's many of those, it can understand and it correlates the finding. Of course, it's very hard to call in static code review finding with dynamic code review finding. But it will do its best. The best thing is, you get the report, you validate the findings, and you get the next work report, you don't have to go through everything again, only the new findings you have to validate. So it's more maintainable, and you can, this one connects to solar, so you even you can have the findings, when the credits come out, you can break the build because of that. That's what you need. An interface between security to development to only give them the relevant findings, enable them to understand it, and to talk with them about something. But I said, the first thing is not to make it perfect, it's not to make it worse. And you can monitor the increase of issues or decrease. You can then help your uh, team to be the most, uh, the, the most productive team with less findings. All the statistics is dangerous. Because I know some teams, they did it really on statistics automated. When you have a drop of findings, you get a prize. There was one project, they were not really active, and they had a small change, and they had two findings and only one. So it was 50% better, and they won a prize. That's not really fair. <laughs> they have to think about good metrics. Uh, do I also have to in there? One second. There's something I don't want to talk about, but I just forgot it. So forget about it. Oops. What was there? Sorry. So, one thing in the testing guide is very valuable, and I think, I'm happy that it moved in test guide 4 from the appendix to the content, are the categories. When you, a security guy, do your security magic, what well, comes out there, a list of findings, maybe a, a summary, a nice dashboard for the business, so many findings, because you found something that is wrong and you have to fix it, but what did you do? Can you tell the developer what you have done to find them? When you only show them the issues, they will not understand how you detect them. So I always say, if there's a security expert who does a security assessment, he does not, in his price utility, go to the developer, pants down, ugly tools, tell them the roadmap, the journey to find those findings, <coughs> it's not good. Because if you only shot an, an, uh, an scanner and went through the findings, and this is your report, you're not a security guy. You're a tool monk. Here, in the categories, you can say, I also use them like, what did you do and what? If it's a new application, of course, I don't need information gathering that much, but I can say, for information gathering, authentication testing, error handling, for all these categories, is it relevant? And what did you do? Because where functional testers are actually the most dedicated resource of testing, because they're very good in scoping. In scoping is important. You are security guys. Ever thought about test coverage you had? But I see a lot of developers, security guys that are very good in one thing, so they take all the time they have to find the one thing because it's in there every time. And all the other stuff they navigate just because they didn't know, didn't realize that time runs on out. With this, you have categories and you can tell them what it tests in the scope, what you had in time. It's not bad to run out of time, but then you see what you have and be able to do. What, or what's the next point? Of course, awareness is very important. And you have to train them. And there are good tools like that, like the almost flagship, the choose shop. It's a German word, uh, joke, uh, word joke. Because soft laden means a bad business. So soft laden, choose shop. <laughs> <laughs> Germans have you. <laughs> that, that was not a joke. So there, there you can do a test, awareness program, and you can set the app. We have the almost WTE, formerly known as many years, formerly known as LiveCD. They have a lot of, it's not a competition to Carl Linux, but it's a Windows tool 
with uh, OWASP tooling and open source tools to just, for when you start, you don't have to install or find everything yourself. It's just a very simple, easy to install uh, distribution. I did mention it, he left anyway, so we also have the web code. Who ever heard about OWASP web code? Who is using it? Which version? The one with Docker installation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there's still version 8 that we're working on. And the city looking for volunteers to help me out because it's a huge job to get everything in there. And next week it's short time, but I think you still can register for it. The upset EU in London, what is it? Why does it say I was German with the Ah, oops, I checked. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm German. <laughs> we are a global community. So in London, we have next week, Monday, Monday Tuesday, Wednesday with the trading days, Thursday, Friday with the conference day. Always conferences, available talks, always, but also the media peers. Always has now, the only thing we make money are the conferences. We are hopefully scale up for four conferences next year. It's the big thing we have to strive for. Yeah? Just in time? No time for questions. No. <laughs> we have time for questions if you have one now. Otherwise, we have more drinks, more pizza out there, and we just talk and have questions there. That's it. Is like, this uh, going to be distributed? To yes, all the presentations will be online. In the chapter meeting uh, repository? Uh, I tweet about it every time and it's in the Netherlands. Yeah. Because, because now I, I have a very clear overview of mm. all tools, tool sets. Uh, so thank you for that. But it's really uh, not easy findable on the wiki yep. side thing. So when you go for owas.nl. <laughs> You'll find it all was. Magic. What? What happened? You should go to the Owas Netherlands website. Online done. Oh, I have your internet, I guess. Hmm. When you go Owas.nl, you find our wiki, you see the text, the, what's coming up. And the uh, historic data, all chat meetings have their own wiki, and there we keep all the presentations. And the recording will be linked soon whenever I have time for that. Oh, or we have a nice <laughs> looking volunteer who does that. Yeah, but you're also here. <laughs> oh. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.